This episode of Engineering the Future is brought to you by Cornerstone Law, the official legal partner of OSPI. OSPI members get 30 minutes of free legal advice with a lawyer. If you have a legal inquiry about your license, engineering practice, unpaid invoices, contracts, or any questions about construction and engineering law in general, please do not hesitate to contact Cornerstone Law. For more information, please visit Cornerstone Law's website at cornerstone.ca or call 416-591-2222. This podcast is brought to you by OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, the advocacy body for professional engineers in the engineering community in Ontario. Welcome to Engineering the Future, a podcast brought to you by the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. I am your host, Jerome James. This is part two of our conversation about tech stewardship and how engineers are taking on the role of stewards to ensure that technology benefits us all. We've been speaking with Mark Abbott, professional engineer and director of the Engineering Change Lab at the Mars Discovery District in Toronto. Uh, I was in the audience when you were on stage about five years ago. We were sitting at the now defunct uh, Google Sidewalk Labs or something. Do you remember the name of that? Yeah, it was Sidewalk Labs was the was the kind of Google back down on the Toronto waterfront where there were, you know, there's all this uh, initial hoopla about smart city technology and creating a test bed. And then quite famously, I think that didn't pan out very well and and wound up folding. And now there's about a bit of a rebirth, I think, with a new path forward on kind of community development in that that same area. Right, right. And there was a really great conversation about AI, emerging technologies, and it was more about the pitfalls of, of um, who is developing the technology, the type of data sets that they were being trained on, you know, are they um, looking at considering all types of people? For instance, is are people with darker skin complexions going to be um, recognized when they put their hand under a certain dryer uh, in restrooms, yada, yada, yada. And then the pending uh, uh, general intelligence that is uh, coming over the horizon. We didn't talk about anything with regards to generative AI during that talk. Remember, like, this came out of nowhere, it seems. Can you talk, uh, put a little bit of sense of what this latest movement is in the AI realm and some of the things that we need to be uh, aware of and thinking critically around this technology um, and how um, tech stewardship can guide us in a in a, a path that we come out of the other side and not in a dystopian future. So again, you know, when that awakening happened in the 1960s around the nature of our relationship with nature, there were seminal moments, right? Rachel Carson writing Silent Spring, the picture of the earth from space, the whole earth catalog. And these were sort of, you know, um, uh, events and things that helped kind of drive the wider awakening. I would say today, you know, going back a few years, the original Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, a, a series of milestones around climate change, and most recently, as you're alluding to, uh, chat GPT and the generative AI kind of step change that happened this earlier this year, uh, from my view, are, are those kind of similar milestone moments that are happening in this larger awakening, right? And so since chat GPT kind of hit the broader consciousness earlier this year, there's been the you know, a flurry of activity, both like optimistic, how do we put this to use everywhere and sort of like more pessimistic and cautious around all of the potential pitfalls. And that there's almost a, a whole new cottage industry around sort of, you know, debate on both sort of sides. What hasn't been in the debate yet is the natural kind of conclusion with generative AI is it's shining a light on that lack of underlying stewardship capacity that exists in society. So some, some really interesting organizations have been making metaphors to um, nuclear weapons and saying like, hey, we need to kind of think of generative AI like nuclear weapons and we need a, you know, we need a, a compact between governments that can kind of regulate all this. What's missed in that analogy is 
Nuclear weapons were a technology that could be governed by nation states effectively. Generative AI, this powerful technology, has just been put in everyone's hands all at the same time. The genie is out of the bottle, right? So you can't regulate it. The dream of top-level policy and regulation is never going to work on its own. What generative AI in particular has really highlighted is something that's always been true, but is becoming more and more acute and hopefully more and more apparent is as a society, there's no quick workaround, no magic policy. We have to invest in the stewardship, the tech stewardship capacity of society writ large if we want to be resilient, um, you know, as, as the continued technological developments happen around generative AI and quantum and all of the new technologies that are coming out. If we don't build that muscle with, as we rise to each of the, you know, the current challenges, if we don't build that underlying muscle to a similar strength to the, to the muscle we've spent, you know, like decades and centuries building to develop technology, then, then we're going to be out of balance and we're going to kind of run ahead with these technologies in a way where the, the negative consequences are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger because of that imbalance between our ability to, to create and, 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 and scale technologies versus our ability to steward them. We hope you're enjoying this episode so far. At OSPI, we're here for you, making sure government, media, and the public are listening to the voice of engineers. You can learn more at ospi.on.ca. But okay, so what does that stewardship look like if it's not a, you know, uh, government, if it doesn't look at like what the European Union is trying to do with um, regulations? Uh, it, does it look, have we not been successful with regulating um, technological advances in the past? You know, we're not, we're, we're not seeing you know, biological three-legged dogs walking around or, or dogs yeah, bred with no eyes. Yeah, there was just an article about someone uh, <laughs> actually trying to do like uh, uh, using CRISPR and gene editing to bring back woolly mammoths, which is, sounds a lot to like the beginning of the Jurassic Park, right? So, um, you, know, you know, I think the short answer is no, we haven't been super successful at proactively regulating technology. Which isn't to say that we shouldn't, like regulation is absolutely part of it and necessary, and we can do better in terms of anticipatory regulation and things that move faster. But I'm of the belief of as much as we need to do that, regulation is never going to be enough. And so what government needs to start doing is not just regulating, putting guardrails in place for specific technologies and challenges. They need to keep doing that, but they need to start massively investing in the steward tech stewardship capacity of society, essentially. Like, again, the, you know, in order to avoid living in one of these dystopian tech futures, we need the regulation, but even more, we need to have this kind of more distributed capacity to, to steward our relationship with technology in all citizens and all, you know, focused in all sectors and all challenges. And that's the awakening. And I think that's, uh, that's just starting to happen right now. And the key to that stewardship is what exactly? Uh, knowledge? Uh... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like continually advancing understanding of our of the nature of technology in general and the specific technologies that are coming up, making more values-based decisions, and actually having that translate in our behaviors. So think again to, um, you know, in the environmental movement, right? Yeah, there was, there was legislation and inter international cooperation on the ozone layer and on, on um, climate change, but there was also the blue bin and there was, you know, people making individual choices about you know, um, uh, how they live and how they heat their homes. And in fact, you know, I, I framed it as an analogy, like the environmental movement, you know, in the sixties and now the awakening to technology, it's actually not an analogy. It's, it's a next chapter in the same story, like environmental stewardship. Like why do we need to worry about the environment is because our, our, the decisions we've made about our technologies and our socio-technological systems have led to an unsustainable relationship with our natural environment. Tech stewardship just takes it kind of a step forward, further in that it's not just the natural environment, it's also our social environment. So technology is sort of shaping our relationship with all our environments, our natural environment, our political environment, our social environment. We need to become more um, aware and more skillful about how we shape, um, you know, how we shape our technology and how we kind of mediate that relationship with all our environments. And I, that was a great example, the whole blue bin scenario, because, um, I believe that that started as a, 
uh, University of Waterloo kind of project or I didn't know that initiative. Well, and huh. it was rolled out in Waterloo, the KW area, before many different areas in, in Canada and then the world. Uh, you know, the KW has had a blue bin program since the 80s. And that's all I've known. So when I have grown up and traveled to different regions and, and it's so foreign to me. Again, I think it all starts with an appreciation of what's actually going on, right? And, you know, to keep going on the... the, the um relating it to the environmental movement, there's a great book called The Wizard and the Prophet that tells the story of almost the pre-environmental movement. So the, the wizard in the book is Norman Borlaug, who's the person who invented dwarf, dwarf wheat that is credited with, you know, saving billions of lives, I think a billion lives from famine in, in Southeast Asia. And so he was the, in, in the book, he's the wizard who was like, technology can save us, we can innovate, we can find a way to feed everyone. The prophet in the book is William Vogt, who is sort of a, a, a precursor to the environmental movement. He was talking about environmentalism before anyone else, ran what a lot of people say was the world's first environmental conference in the 40s. And so the book kind of contrasts these two worldviews, the, the wizard who's going to kind of always technologically innovate their way out of problem, and the prophet who's saying, wait a minute, we already have too many people, you know, uh, on the planet, and it, there's no way to keep this sustainable, and new technologies are just kind of fooling us to squeeze more, more people into a planet that's already oversubscribed. And so um, imagine uh, William Vogt, it, like later in his life, actually committed suicide because despite all of the things he did to sort of bring attention to this, he, he felt like he failed. He saw something before everyone else, way before everyone else. He had made heroic efforts to bring it to the public attention. And even though, you know, by any objective standard, he did an amazing job of this, he felt like he'd failed because he saw how much more there was to do. I think our challenge today is for me and for you and for others who are seeing the awakening that needs to happen right now is how do we learn from what's been successful in the past and use new social technologies and digital technologies to accelerate the awakening that's happening, right? So in the environmental movement, we can look at that analogy, the blue bin for all of its kind of more tangible um, uh, impacts also had a big social impact. Hey, I have a role in this. We all have a role in this, right? So if we're thinking about as change makers now, what's the modern day equivalent of the blue bin? And I don't know for sure, but I'm wondering if it could be the cell phone. Like we all have probably somewhat problematic relationships with our cell phone and, you know, and how it's uh, been set up and what we're doing. So maybe, you know, as we're looking for what are those leverage points that actually drive this larger awakening, maybe, um, you know, there's something like uh, each of us kind of becoming more intentional or our relationship with the cell phone that might be the modern day equivalent to the blue bin. Right, right. Oh man, I, I feel that if people learned more about the controls that they had over being inundated with ads or uh, notifications that they can really take hold and, and be more uh, meaningful and mindful of, of their tech journey, I, I think everyone should take some sort of like course on how to actually... <laughs> use your phone wisely and turn off notification, all that kind of stuff. Cause it's not in, in intuitive and it's set up in a way for you to fail at the beginning. And maybe that's something that needs to, to change in legislation. Well, and, and ideally if the reason I, I talk about cell phones is because it's so ubiquitous and everything, but kind of like the blue bin, ideally we find something that, um, everyone can relate to, everyone can actually engage with. So like, this is one small step in tech stewardship but people don't stop there. You realize that that same, the same kind of dynamics that are at play there, the same value tensions, you know, my, my privacy, my convenience, my wanting to kind of like connect with other people versus like numbing and, and, and sort of avoiding thinking about things. Cause I'm, I'm, I'll just watch another show on Netflix. Those like fundamental tensions, those same kind of patterns of tensions show up, you know, in other parts of our day-to-day -day life, when we're deciding whether or not to buy an electric vehicle or to like install a heat pump, when we're deciding where to live and like the, you know, the various kind of components around that, it shows up in our workplace when we're, you know, when we're designing, like maybe we work for a power company and there's a tension between centralized, you know, um, power versus distributed power. The better we build that muscle of spotting those tensions in our own life, our work life, in our, our sort of, you know, our societal dialogue, we're building the, the, the underlying capacity to deal with all the problems, not just one problem, right? Exactly. 
data privacy and security are critical aspects of tech stewardship. Uh, what strategies should organizations employ to protect sensitive data and ensure user privacy? Yeah, you know, uh, this is a great example of there are so many best practices and principles and, and guidelines being put out there. I would say uh, one of the great things about tech stewardship practice is you build uh, sort of a habit, a rhythm of socioethical reflection. And as you're doing that, you can connect out to what are the latest tools and resources that suit your own context. So there's no one answer to how to handle privacy and data stuff that, that I think is kind of universally helpful and applicable. If you're working in different contexts, the answer is different. And there's probably already tools and guidelines out there that you could use. The problem is that those tools and guidelines get written and then they sit on the shelf, right? And that's why practice is real, where the real bottleneck is. It isn't that people don't care about these issues. It isn't even that they don't have tools in the toolkit. It's that people aren't day-to-day -day seeing, perceiving, finding those opportunities to put you know, their concern and all of the tools that are already in the toolkit and all, all the tools that are available to use. Interesting. Um, and, and does that change the way that we should be thinking about privacy? Uh, does these new uh, technologies, sh do new technologies change our relationship with security? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? When I say that, you know, our, our values shaped and are shaped by technology, right? Like a classic example people will point out is, you know, Google Home or Alexa, right? The idea that, that you would have a, a listening device in your home all of the time that, you know, isn't even government, it's a private company, is something that we built up to, right? If you went back far enough and, you know, if you went back further uh, before some of like the developments with recent technologies and our kind of societal norms around around uh, privacy, it would have been much more shocking that concept 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the further you go back, right? And so um, the, it's an ongoing kind of co-evolution with our technologies. We're, we're shaping our technology as our technology is shaping us, including what is acceptable, what we see is normal, what's, you know, um, and so I, don't know, I can't remember when the first Jurassic Park came out, where it was like 20, 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, there's a classic quote in that, that we actually draw out to talk about the meta tension with technology, which is, uh, this is, it's kind of a paraphrase quote, quote, but in the movie it was, we were so busy wondering, can we do it? We didn't stop to say, should we do it? And that tends to be the meta tension that plays out over and over again, is the can we do it kind of should we do it mindset. And so, as I mentioned before, now fast forward a few decades from that movie, and there's a company that's looking at reviving only mammoths using like the similar technology that was referred to in Jurassic Park. So, we can kind of um, almost have the goalposts move over time as, you know, technology kind of, you know, is shaping what's our, our values as a society, our shared values and what's acceptable. And so I think a big part of tech stewardship is, is kind of regaining control of that, allowing rather than allowing that to drift or allowing, you know, whatever a company can make money on to be sort of the thing that pulls our values and directions. We need to become, you know, wait a minute, what's the world we want to see? What are the values that we want to be on place? How do we want to not just be all privacy or all convenience? How do we get the best of both? That's the kind of the essence of, of the what needs to happen. Right, right. And and because this is a, a fairly heady subject, I want to get a little bit more into like specific scenarios and in different um, uh, industries. So I'm gonna I have three different industries here, and I'm gonna uh, have a quick back and forth with you. Um, I'm going to say an industry and then you're going to give me some ideas to think about if I work in, if I'm a, an engineer in this, in this industry, uh, for instance, let's say aerospace. Yeah. And aerospace, and let's take space, the space part of it more broadly, right? You look at some of the issues of, um, of debris in space, of militarization of space, of international cooperation as orbits get kind of, you know, taken up more. These are, there's some real tensions in this, right? We want uh, you know, how do we get more sort of a, a collective governance of space, but how do we also allow for innovation and even private companies to, to develop? So um, in each specific context, like space, there's unique things to what's going on and the issues that are kind of to be at play. But the meta tension of can we do it, should, should we do it, tends to exist. And, you know, when we introduce people to tech stewardship, we introduce kind of an X layer of the onion where um, there tend to be sort of common tensions around 
um, seeking purpose, taking responsibility, expanding inclusion, and how we kind of work to kind of create regeneration. And so we're kind of, uh, we go from the meta tension into sort of different levels of the onion, and then we wind up applying that to a specific context like space and around those different issues. And so the same kind of ideas uh, are are present no matter what I throw out there, like healthcare or manufacturing. Yeah, and so in healthcare, right? I mean, you could look at things around, um, let's take gene editing, right? Like the ability CRISPR and some of those technologies could have huge dramatic effects on, on healthcare outcomes, right? They could also go horribly wrong, right? Like the can we do it, should we do it? What if we, um, you know, we're playing with more and more powerful technologies, which means unforeseen consequences or, uh, or inequality? Like what happens when healthcare, uh, you know, th I, would, I would argue there's already a large inequality created by people with access to healthcare who are going to live longer and be healthier and more productive and, and people who don't, right? As the technologies get stronger and stronger, that inequality grows as well too. So again, the same tensions kind of play out in different settings around, um, you know, and you can kind of zoom in on, it's often the intersection of these powerful new technologies and those sectors, right? So CRISPR and AI with healthcare, for example, right? Like all of the, the, the privacy, you know, issues you were talking about when it comes to healthcare, right? Is a, is a, is a unique double click on AI and privacy in the healthcare context. So it's the confluence of these things. And that's where, when we build our overall tech stewardship, um, uh, muscles as a society. And as we each build our own tech stewardship practice, it needs to be multifaceted. So let's say I'm a mining engineer, um, working on like AI, um, for haul trucks and I can't, and I personally care about climate change. Those are kind of four communities I, I belong to. I belong to the mining community, the engineering community, the climate change community, the AI community, right? And a lot of the opportunity and the risks exist in the, in the overlap and the confluence of those communities. And we need to stop siloing them and rather encourage people to, uh, to kind of break out of the silos and actually connect across those communities and ways of thinking. Great. Yeah. I don't, I don't even have to throw the last one in there. You, you uh, molded it all together. Um, I think that that really breaks it down for our listeners that this is cross disciplinary that you have to be thinking outside of the box and like you said, not in your own silos and thinking how your, your work affects everyone else's work and society as a whole going forward into the future. And practically when we're breaking out of those silos, find the people that are at the opposite extreme of you. So remember I said that the meta tension being, can we do it and should we do it, right? Engineering is a, can we do it leaning field? which is great. It should be, right? It's like, it's, it's a belief in technology and optimism where, you know, we're going to proactively solve the problem. That's great. Until you overdo, can we do it thinking to the exclusion of should we do it thinking? And then you get, you know, a tendency to jump to action too quickly, unforeseen consequences or in Jurassic Park parlance, you know, everyone gets eaten by a dinosaur, right? So it's recognizing their strength in can we do it thinking and their strength in should we do it thinking that's more reflective and thinks about, you know, the impacts on everyone and, and, you know, it takes a bit more of a cautionary tale. That's great too, until you overdo it to the exclusion of can we do it thinking, and then you get analysis paralysis. So, so tech stewardship is not about everyone being a perfect balance between can we do it and should we do it. Engineering should be a can we do it field. Policy um, should be a should we do it field. But we need to sort of recognize the need for the other and start to make those connections. So if I'm a real engineer's engineer who's like super optimistic about technology, realizing that, hey, I need to actually stretch myself to connect to some people who are more pessimistic and concerned and to understand where they're coming from and what they're valuing. And by making those connections, by reaching out to the others with those other perspectives, that's, a, that's the, um, the powerful kind of like, you know, first step and kind of essence of the tech stewardship practice is that kind of interconnection. And so can the government's role not only be uh, played in uh, policymaking, but also funding for tech stewardship to be uh, proliferated or create space for these ideas to uh, not for profits to to grow and accelerate and uh, what do you see the the role of government outside of just policy making in in this tech stewardship space yeah I, I think as government wakes up to the bigger story of what's going on as government starts to realize we've made such an investment in you know, the ability to create and scale technology and innovation. Um, but those muscles are, are super overdeveloped versus our stewardship muscles. 
Um, as that broader awakening comes up, absolutely, government can start to, in all sorts of ways, invest in society's stewardship capacity. One simple way is, if you look at most government programs around the world, federally, provincially, around innovation, like everyone's investing in innovation, which is mostly tech innovation, right? Most of that investment is just more. We just want more tech, more innovation, more jobs, you know, is, is kind of the subtext, right? Government could just start becoming a more sophisticated investor. They could say, listen, we don't want just more innovation in tech and jobs. We also want to make sure that that innovation in tech and jobs is creating the world we want to see and not accelerating our arrival in a Black Mirror episode or, or dystopian future. So even just demanding more of all that innovation or investment around innovation or take education rather than just like, hey, we want more K-12 STEM programs that are going to turn up more engineers who won't ask questions or, or will have kind of like a, a naive optimism, which is, I, I'd say, the default in engineering right now is engineers are good people. They want to do good things. But I think we often almost perpetuate a naive optimism. You know, like people say, well, what's engineering? And, and a progressive answer is often like, well, engineering is a mindset and engineers are problem solvers. So we, we churn out these people who by default actually haven't been challenged to understand, you know, like the nature of that mindset or, the, or what type of problems. Like you could say that any profession is, you know, are problem solvers and have a distinct mindset. I think what's often unique about kind of engineering promotion and K to 12 promotion, STEM promotion is this like, oh, you know, you have a magical mindset, you could solve every problem. So we're churning out naive optimists who think that like, hey, you know, all we need is an engineer in decision making because we have this magical mindset that can solve any problem. That's dangerous, that lack of self-awareness to not know what type of problems and what type of mindset. So government could say, hey, when we fund post-secondary institution, when we fund K to 12 STEM education, we're going to demand that it's not just how to create and develop technology and scale it, but that stewardship is actually embedded and woven in at all stages. Because we've actually come to realize that churning out people who have the ability to create technology who don't have this stewardship muscle, that don't have the stewardship practice, is dangerous, right? It's actually a recipe for winding up in a black mirror or, or a dystopian future. Absolutely. More social science classes embedded into your technologically. Well, and it's not just like, it's not about engineers becoming PhDs in ethics, like we have PhDs <laughs> in ethics. It's actually, you know, it's actually about everyone connecting. So what engineers can benefit from the social scientists is more the should we do it kind of mindset. But what the social scientists can benefit from engineers and, and others on the can we do it side is the appreciation of the, of the actual, like um, the creation process and the neat, the technical nature of the technology, what's becoming possible and everything, right? You need both. So it's about you know, creating those bridges so that people can practice, so they can come, you know, not everyone needs to become everything, but we need to connect all the pieces that exist. And the way to do that is to have each individual understand the necessity for that interconnection, right? For, I think what happens now in a lot of engineering classes, for example, engineering programs is, oh, I had a tech and society class, but it was never contextualized. It was never translated. It was never, you know, you're taking someone out of an engineering stream and putting them into a whole other stream of, of, of sort of student development without the necessary, you know, bridging. And that's where I think the big problem is happening right now. N know your limits and know when you need to, uh, consult someone that knows more in an area that you don't know. Know thyself, right? Isn't that the, is that Socrates or it's writ writ written above the temple of Delphi, right? Like that's the, especially for people who are wielding such immense power in society, whether we realize it or not, um, there's a great uh, example um, in a book called uh, Technology and the Virtues, where they're talking about how, you know, they're, they're using um, the example of some engineers working for a social media company in Silicon Valley who are, who are building a social media platform that's going to scale globally and don't even realize that they're unconsciously building in their own values about privacy and whatnot into the, into the fabric of the technology that's going to scale globally and then be used, say, in mainland China, where there's a very, you know, there might be very different dominant societal values around privacy. So I think part of the current reality is the engineering profession has been wielding a power that we haven't even fully appreciated. And we, with, been in, with good intentions, we've been embedding the dominant values of engineering into our physical, digital, biological world. And so we've been, you know, scaling this. So know thyself becomes even more critical when you're going to be someone who's wielding that type of power. This has been a, a deep and dense episode. 
<laughs> definitely a lot of things to think about and to chew on. Uh, I'm glad that we were able to go there today. Um, one last question. Looking ahead, uh, what kind of trends do you foresee uh, happening within the realm of tech stewardship? How can engineers and organizations prepare for uh, these developments? Yeah, I, uh, I think there's a huge opportunity here for the engineering profession to lead. And in fact, it might be the only way it could happen, right? Because if we look at the overall dynamics and say, okay, how do we intervene in what's going on here? And if we think of it in terms of the can we do it and the should we do it groups, right? The can we do it communities, engineering is kind of um, in the power position because while others are talking about it or not even grasping what's happening yet, engineers are running ahead and just doing it, right? So we actually have the power to be the ones who's, who open this up to others who haven't traditionally been involved in the conversation about how technology is actually being shaped at a societal level. And this is a huge change. This We've been talking a little bit more at a philosophical level. But thankfully, like we've had a little bit of a head start with, you know, eight years ago, the Engineering Change Lab launched and OSPI has been involved in the very beginning and all of the leaders and organizations, you know, we, we started kind of looking within the engineering silo and then started to look up at this problem in tech society early. And so we've been developing this concept of tech stewardship. And so in a way, we were almost paddling before this wave that we now see growing is coming. So we actually have in the concept of tech stewardship and even in some of the offerings, like the practice program, you know, for OSPE members, they can actually, a professional members, there's a discounted version of a tech stewardship practice program on the website where you could actually, um, you know, help get help launching and connecting your practice. Or if you're a student, uh, if you're a current student, it's actually free. So we have these kind of early offerings right now where it's, it doesn't have to be conceptual. Those programs show you how you can bring tech stewardship into your own studies or your own work. And our model for overall change is if enough individuals, you know, start to practice, like say within their, they bring it to their team and their team kind of starts to like, you know, bring it to their organization and their organization starts to bring it to their sector. You could actually start to, you know, hit more and more individuals kind of engaging. You can reach these local tipping points. You know, the, the social science says if you can get 25% of a population thinking about and seeing and behaving in a new way, the rest of the curve will tend to follow. So we're looking for the innovators and the early adopters, in particular within the engineering profession, to lead the way. Um, because we can, you know, we can kind of create these nested tipping points that will eventually add up to, you know, creating tech stewardship as a new normal in society. But if you can connect to that big change that needs to happen right down to my choices and your choices day to day to kind of engage with this type of practice. Wow. It's clear that from our conversation today, Tech stewardship isn't just a buzzword. It's an imperative for engineers. In our rapidly evolving digital landscape, prioritizing ethical and responsible tech practices isn't just commendable. It's essential for shaping a better, more sustainable future. Thank you, Mark, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jerome. Uh, yeah, it was a pleasure and uh, looking forward to continuing uh, collaboration with OSPI. I'm an OSPI member. OSPI has been involved in the whole creation process of creating tech stewardship and, you know, within that broader engineering profession leadership, um, OSPI, I think, uh, is well positioned to continue to be a leader amongst, uh, leaders. Thank you for that. Um, and as always, thank you to our audience. Uh, if you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe and leave a comment. And that's it for another episode. I've been speaking with Mark Abbott, Director of Engineering Change Lab at Mars. I'm your host, Jerome James. You've been listening to Engineering the Future, and we'll see you next time. From all of us at OSPI, the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, thanks for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode.